Okay. Uh, how are you? I'm good. I like you have like a cool studio setup. It seems like a really nice camera and all the different angles and audio. Is that uh, for teaching or what? What uh, seems yeah, different fun. than last time? But maybe I'm. It's why well, I don't use this during the sessions because during the sessions it's very um well it just takes up a lot you know if if, if the internet breaks down so it's not very good but uh i use this for the recorded lectures and for oh nice and for the for, well for youtube at this point you know yeah yeah thank you so much uh for wanting to do this i know you barely know me and uh I'm um, just like sending you poetry and asking for your time. And uh, yeah, it's really cool that you were interested in this. No worries. I have exactly one hour. Okay, perfect. So, I've, got uh, to, I've got to be somewhere else. Um, but yeah, uh, this is this for YouTube also? Is this for your channel? Yeah, I'll post it online. Uh, yeah. And it's kind of cool that it'll it'll broaden it beyond just like philosophy people and science people. So I'm excited about kind of some art and poetry yeah. uh, showing up. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, if you want, uh, we could just kind of talk about things we like about art for a minute to kind of just be people rather than jumping into any high level points. Or I, I would really love if you would read your translation uh, of the Holderland poem as part of this process. I don't, so which one is that? Um, uh, it says the translation of the Muse, if I'm not mispronouncing it. The Muse. The Muse, yeah. So um, I don't have, so what I, I have, have the copy here, if you want me to just copy into the chat, if that's what you're referencing. Yeah, you can do that, but I've, so I have, I haven't, I didn't translate the entire poem. I have a few parts of it. Okay. Yeah. Well, what Th Thomas shared with me was awesome. And that's really why I reached out because Thomas, Errol, and I, just to give you uh -huh. some context, we're meeting uh, just to talk about art and, and explore it as kind of people in the world. And yeah. Tom one day shared this and I'm like, oh, this is amazing. The, I, I am learning Greek a little bit through translation and yeah. uh, some of uh, some philosophers like will cite things in foreign languages quite a bit. So I love that there's this, the original in its language as people spoke it. But then when people translate, there's so much uniqueness and beauty sometimes brought to those translations. I thought this was just uh, like just an amazing uh, interpretation of this poem since it's not in English. Maybe send me, thank you. Maybe send me what you have. Yeah, would you want it emailed or I can just I, I have, copy and chat if that's easier. Yeah, and I, I have the I have the lecture open, I think, from which probably oh, Thomas awesome. has this. It's part of my course on German idealism with Hölderlin as the poet of German idealism, as I claim he is rather than a just a, as is usually pigeonholed as a romantic. So, and the What's poem, the difference just to kind of- uh, Well, there's the striking difference insofar yeah, yeah. as with the romantics, the German romantics, uh, one has to be careful because there's so many different romantics. Uh, there's the French, the English, etc. And there's a tendency, by the way, especially in Britain, for example, by Roger Scruton. Uh, Roger Scruton just lumps everybody into German Romanticism, which is a bit bizarre. Uh, for him, even Immanuel Kant becomes a romantic, which makes absolutely no sense. Why? Because for the Romantics, freedom plays almost, well, freedom plays only a role insofar as it's, uh, it's a bit, okay, there's an exaggeration on my part, but uh, there's a threat in German Romanticism to get lost in a, what we perhaps refer to as a fetish of nature and a certain shadowy, gloomy uh, understanding of, of, of human uh, being rather than um, seeing error uh, not as absolute but as part of it. And at the same time, what they refer to as irony turns into um, an egotistical, a distance from 
the world. So it's precisely the opposite of what happens in this poem, where it's a dimuse, usually translated as leisure, uh, from Hölderlin, where it is only through moving outside oneself, becoming an eagle, coming back to the eye. So, so it's only through leaving the human being behind that we come back to the human being. So there's through a negation of oneself, where you find the complete opposite in the Schlegel brothers, for example, who, uh, who uh, as Hegel says in the introduction to his aesthetics, take the transcendental eye of Fichte, the self-positing eye, as absolute, and really simply then uh, <clears throat> cast the world into, into nothingness because it, of course, is never good enough for them. And the right. ideal, yeah. idealism wants, right. idealism is absolute in the sense that it bridges subject and object. They want to bring those two together, you know, you reunify them. Right. Yeah. So, so there's a, um, there's a way of looking at psychology as like an ego needs to, or starts or whatever, separated from the world. And then you make this thing that can operate in the world. And then like you're saying, you need to actually reconnect to the world somehow, or you're forever either too subjective, or like you said, on the opposite end, you can become almost like uh, disembodied and completely unconnected to the sensual moment from which you are. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, and exactly. And this is, this, is all, this is very present in Fichte, who's not a romantic, that is crucial for this for for the romantic movement, and and Fichte today has a bit of a comeback, uh, unfortunately, because for Fichte it's it's completely arbitrary. The human being just makes himself. So right, know. Tanabe, I was reading with uh, Daniel and our friends, uh, who thank you for bringing them together, and then me joining them through that i don't think they the people i meet with literally this morning would know each other if not for you and then i love spending time with them so seth and thomas and zeb and daniel and we, we read the uh, philosophy of metanoetics and he has the tabi has praise for i'm gonna butcher this i'm from florida in the united states so our our appreciation of the nuances of language are not uh not to your level maybe but 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 Fichte to to um, he says like, oh, it's cool because at least he is getting some of these things right. He's connecting art and the world a little bit, but he still fails to really get that metanoetic bursting through or connection or, or however you want to describe it. So at the same time as he says like, oh, this is kind of cool. These, this, these Europeans doing some good things, but he kind of reject, even Eckhart, he rejects who like I find Eckhart, um, his writing is, is amazing to me. Um, so it's interesting how in Japan, right? I, I, in the last couple of months, learned about Heidegger's Japan dialogue. It's one of my favorite writings. And it, it's so, you can just feel the tension between like Europe and Japan where like Japan is so embedded and embodied and in the imagination and in the world. And then he's talking to Heidegger and they're going, oh, I'm a little worried. Either we're never gonna see eye to eye or like you're the, the view that Europe has is going to just pull the beauty out of Japan and forever. It's, it's a kind of a interesting thing, at least from my, what I've read of it. Um, so these, I, and I love, so the romantics, what were they reacting against? Like, why are they so popular and why might they have been necessary at some, in some level or. Uh, well, <laughs> philosophically, Schlegel, Friedrich Schlegel, is <clears throat> after Kant the first one who more and more explicitly than Fichte allows for dialectics. Reason shows itself with Kant, not to go into too much detail, to be dialectical, but the result for Kant is purely illusory. And Schlegel, this is in late the late 18th century, around the turn of the century, from 1800, uh, sorry, from 1799 to 1800 or so, Schlegel allows for 
dialectics to also have a positive result and hence it pushes further that's philosophically significant and what they perhaps this is one way of understanding the romantics and the, then again you, you'd have to distinguish between uh, the german romantics and the and, and the english for example there is by the way goethe loathed them you know he, he loathed the, uh, the the romantics on all sides uh, but he uh, the, the romantics are in some sense a reaction against the aging of the world <laughs> And they're not yet quite pessimists, but they do long to return to another older world that is long gone. They want to return to youth, and they can't. Mm -hmm. Right. And, <laughs> That's the uh, to, to the youth, <laughs> yeah, to youth of the world, to quote Novalis, I'm always going home, always to the house of my father. And yeah, it's it's it speaks often either of despair, but the as I said, the the most ho horrendous consequence can be to cast everything into well nothingness. For nothing is good enough for that self positing absolute self absolutized subjectivity and hence the threat of it because there's other aspects to it also if you look at Shelley's Prometheus Unbound it's quite strikingly different from Novalis or so there um, <clears throat> Prometheus is presented as the great liberator of man the great champion of man as he says it himself uh, who should not be bound at all but who should actually uh, who should overcome who should more than just overcome who should rule rather than Zeus but that would mean to have a titanic rule which is a rule of disorder right Even that's a classic error that they make like the bad ratio of <laughs> when they interpret the world or when they're living in the world and speaking and writing and making works of art um and that's interesting that you brought the youthfulness and it's such a that's like what we are when we're children. It's like we have no sense of boundary and we have these naive images of how things work. And uh, yeah, that's that's excellent. And so and there, there, is, there is this trajectory, which is ultimately a different one from the Faustian one also, uh, but that's maybe for another time to discuss. <laughs> I know there's so many paths you can go down because it's such a uh, an interesting, it's post-medieval and it's, pre-modern right so it's in this kind of cool spot of history where it's got these these elements of both um and then the modern kind of fantasy of of um like you said the domination there is like that that error of domination that we still share with the romantics in some of our tendencies you could say uh and, and that's interesting that like, so, so the way I like the way you view idealism, because when I was taught it in college, it was like the disembodied mind. It was like, oh, you're an idealist. Oh, then you're not a realist. And so you're like unable to, to connect to reality. But like you, you put it much more as like the ultimately connected reality because it, it reconnects. Uh, is that fair oh. or? Yeah, we, we, so I mean, the, the, also the term realism has, has several meanings which are often forgotten realism is it can be it can actually also refer to plato in some sense insofar as the world isn't constructed so there's a realism constructivism debate then in that sense of realism that you would just um mentioning is there's only one idealist that i'm aware of who where the real disappears really in perception and that's george barclay 
which American, Americans pronounce as Berkeley and uh, have named with a mispronunciation an entire university after him. Is that true? So, as far as I know. Wow. So George Berkeley, uh, Bishop Berkeley, he was, I think, Irish. He stands between John Locke and David Hume. He takes John Locke to the logical consequence of that empiricism and ends up in a position where he has to say, also in order to defend, however, that's important, to defend against atheists, he says, este es percipi, being is to be perceived. So being is reduced to being perceived and to perceiving. So the, where we dwell in Rome, now that's a bit of a mispronunciation. Mis, uh, well, it's a quote from St. Paul, in whom we roam and have our being. God is a sensorium that perceives the world and in, through perception, all continues to exist when you and I close our eyes. So that's, that is an idealism that really completely um, dismantles anything real or organic and turns it into the, the moment of pure being perceived. That's not the case in thinkers like Schelling or Hegel at all. Uh, I idealism in Hegel is, well, or in Schelling, <clears throat> Schelling speaks of, speaks of uh, real idealism, real idealism, the real as, um, the body of philosophy and the ideal as its spirit or soul <clears throat> that enlivens it. And it is, I mean, Hegel is a bit more sophisticated uh, than that. Uh, but idealism in Hegel means that things that are finite and they can be very material, they are nonetheless also ideal moments. Um, or, or else what you would have is just thing after thing after thing after thing, singular entities that don't really come together, not part of a, a continuous process, as it were. So, you know, and the hand is only a hand as long as it's not just attached randomly to this lump that we can call body, but is a hand only insofar as it really belongs right here, uh, to uh, the arm and is a finite moment of a continuous organic process that is the living body in German, the Leib, the living body, you know, not just a body like another, like any other. Right, not a corpse, <laughs> right, not a, a yeah, lump of the, stuff. Yeah, it's a, like a lump. It's, a, it's unfortunate that the English doesn't have a word for Leib. It only has body. So anything could be a body, you know, this is a body here, that thing. That bottle is a. That's body. very Greek, and I, I'm reading English Greek, but that's very like. Even when you say the the Johannes and the Rob and the ship, like it kind of puts everything together. And I don't know. I feel a lot of times when I'm reading Greek, it, it's they don't discern the living and the non-living in this like way that you're saying. And again, like very naively. How do you mean? I don't. I'm not. I'm not sure. I follow. Well, like just when and they do it in kind of a cool way because they're so in their world and embodied that when they say like the thing it feels more like alive and dynamic but they still point to things as things or, or point to life as things in a way that like allows you to deconstruct them let's say and have them be like non-unity unlike how the hand just fits with the wrist and with the rest of the self Maybe I'm just way out of, out of bounds. You're so much smarter than me in this. It's, it's hard to keep up with you. I'm probably just like my unconscious is trying to create sentences that, that are like, that sounds like that should go with that. But, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but do send me, do put the, uh, the maybe the. That Absolutely. Yeah, I emailed it to you. Chat, I, will, I know. I'll put well, it in here as well. I have it open. So I can see whatever Thomas sent you. Yeah, if you want to, in here, I'll put it in the chat, see if it's small enough to pay. I think and Thomas we'll, was in this course. Yeah. That's how he probably. Yeah, so. The. 
<clears throat> what we can perhaps go over it is in general um yeah. the, the you poem just read a verse. would you do that and yeah uh, but a verse is just a verse you know without the poem so well but people we can could, see that just to feel it like this to have the translator here and to feel it with you would be just cool I'll, I'll go over it but i have to uh, explain the poem first Absolutely. so the The poem is entitled Die Muse, which is usually translated as leisure, and I won't go too much into that now, but Muse can have a very different meaning in German, which is forgotten. It can be spatial. What's striking about the poem is that nothing of the sort of human beings working and after work enjoying some free time is mentioned it's a poem on nature it begins as follows in german the first line or verse is sorglos schlummert die brust und es ruhen die strengen gedanken so free from worry the chest slumbers and the strict thoughts rest this is a very close um translation of the german and so strict thoughts, thoughts that are dogmatic, thoughts that are perhaps not only dogmatic, but also uh, rigid. And so those, uh, they rest. And I think also maybe thought schemata. And he's trying to, well, not trying, but the poetical eye articulates here a way of of itself, finding itself in this realm that is called Muse. It's not Muse, by the way, it's uh, with a sharp S. So uh, has, as I said, a spatial dimension to it. This is another line, another translation. Out onto the meadows I stroll with the grass from the root freshly like the wellspring sprouts for me where the lovely lip of the flower opens itself for me and breathes at me with fresh othum or fresh breath, but othum is the, in the original. So here you can see that it's not some I or ego that posits itself and somehow also just wants to posit um, a not I, an opposition to itself, but it's a, a move outwards, right? out onto this very close. It's moving out into or onto the meadows, a strolling. Uh, but immediately it's the grass that sprouts up or springs up from um, the root is mentioned, as you can hear. So it's a rootedness of everything that occurs, a freshness. And that freshness is also I think relates to the thinking here. It's a thinking that has a, an, uh, an othum and an odor of its own. This is very foreign to us today, but if you think of Nietzsche, for example, Nietzsche says somewhere that his thinking is one that smells like a field in October uh, or a meadow in October. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, the world isn't just the human world. It's it's the whole of creation, right? Each each the, the grass is not trying to be a grass for the people, and it's it's but it's there. It's present, and and all the the rich the rich soil is just soiling, and the the flowers are flowering, and uh, but but not in some oh I'm writing poetry, but it is poetic because life is poetic. Yeah, and uh, I'm I just because of them, we're on Nietzsche. I'll be in um, I'll be in Sicily in about three, no, yeah, three months. Nietzsche spent some time in Sicily, in Messina, in exactly two hundred and forty years ago. So that's why there's going to be a there will be a, uh, a conference on his, not on his time in Nicena, but on Nietzsche's philosophy. 
and I've been invited to give a talk. So oh, congratulations. I am still, that's awesome. Thank you. I'm still somewhat, uh, you know, connected to the academic uh, world, but in a in a free way. Without yeah, that's it's it's awesome of you of that you have the training, but then you actually get to be freer than the average academic, because it's it's people do the the opposite, right? They just eschew the training, and then they have to be brilliant but untrained, um, or they become slaves to the university and never get to like really be beautiful in the world. So you're you've gotten the training and are now free to kind of live your adult life as as an independent person with integrity and respect self-respect and but still you're like respected in the academic world and you can speak but in both worlds um which i just i love i think that's really cool um because there is something good about the academic training that can't be replicated just yeah. by reading books um yeah and it's and that's that's a very important point that you make which is something we need to find out somehow how so i just because so much talk about institutions are falling apart the university is, <laughs> is yeah. banned the university is dead um from a by analogy when you look at 20 years ago a bit more perhaps when mp3 was invented you you know the music industry is dead uh, oh yeah, well, I remember that. I remember my friend walked over to my house and was like, "There's a thousand songs on this CD," and I was <laughs> like, "What?" I owned like hundred CDs, and he's like, "No, I have that many. I just went to this weird website called like whatever that was Napster or whatever, and I got all the music I've ever wanted, and it's on this one tiny device." And then I lived near malls, and they just the record stores and the CD stores just disappeared over about a six year span, as <laughs> that yeah. world those two worlds interacted that's true so those they disappeared that's the case these these you know the, the, the some of the cd many of them of these music stores have disappeared and it is a very different interaction with music now it's one that's a lot less mm, intense i would think you know it's in terms of time i remember buying a record and you i you know listen to it at the store first is it any good don't want to buy it <laughs> And then you take it home and you read the lyrics. That's how I learned English was mostly with listening to American rock bands. <laughs> but uh, the music industry hasn't died. You know, uh, well, actually, they're more powerful than ever because now they don't just sell one record once, they sell it to you every single day. And especially if you own, if you yeah, own Amazon does stuff, that. You know, when you, anyone, I, I buy online books. And as soon as you die, you can't even give them to someone. It's... Well, but, but with <laughs> music streaming, you just don't buy it, you know, you rent it. So they, 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 you, they rent it out to you every single day again and again, especially with the big hits. So if, so to bring us back to the university, I don't think that universities are going to go extinct. I have, I have the severe uh, I do so on the topic of leisure or idleness. They are not very good places anymore, to put it mildly, for otium, and they are no longer following the Wilhelm Humboldtian, uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt's university or educational ideal. If anyone's interested, I'm sure Robert did you link to my channel. Um, there's a lecture on my channel on Wilhelm von Humboldt that also epitomizes a 30 minute lecture, my own understanding of what education should be. However, I'm obviously a product, if you like, or the result of a very classical European humanistic education. I had Latin and ancient Greek at school, plus English. Went to Italy to study economics and philosophy and politics and also the us by the way so i saw the us system um, at the university of washington and from italy i went to the uk to london first then to warwick to do a phd that was over the span of ten, and I, i've written extremely long pieces my my thesis in or dissertation or whatever in in italy was half as long as my phd 
So that that's just what expect is expected on the in terms of size on the continents. I wrote about fifty thousand words on Hayek, on the godfather of neoliberalism. Yeah, no, I know <laughs> Hayek very well. I've read I've read his works, and and I wanted if there were jobs in libertarianism. There's like three positions in the U.S. Uh, I would yeah. have tried to go for one. I have basically a master's in economics, and yeah. I was just reading probably almost seven or eight thousand hours of just a lot of especially libertarian thought. And I think von Mises is just a beautiful thinker, and Hayek as well. And um, so, yeah, that's awesome. I love how how um, like polyhedral you are. You're so rich in economics and philosophy and art and uh, do you sculpt or do like do architecture or anything? <laughs> You'd be like the, the perfect man. <laughs> no, I don't sculpt at all. I, 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 uh, my father is, or was, he's now retired, uh, except for a few private engagements. He was a restorer. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's, oh. that's a whole hands-on, you have to have vision awesome. and expertise. Yeah, that's... We don't need to restore things in the U.S. We just don't have old things, or we yeah. demolish them and build like a new thing. <laughs> well, there's so, a couple of places like Boston or maybe New York, you know. Sure, sure. I'm being but, a little yeah. hyperbolic for sure. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah. Uh, no. So my father restored churches and castles, uh, and I did help, but I'm at no, uh, no, you know, nowhere near his. Art, artistry, but my. The question really is going forward with so what i'm trying to build or what i am building this is now in the third year is as you know um, a philosophy academy which for now is mostly online but leads to people finding the others to um, to quote timothy leary and and in and it's so in, in one respect it allows me to be free and teach what I see as necessary in teaching, not because of my ego, but because of what is necessary to be taught in a certain way, which is difficult to get across, but there are certain fundamental ways of thinking that need to be learned. And at the same time, it opens it up to those who maybe would not have become familiar with it. At the same time, what is, <clears throat> I can only do this because I've gone through decades of uh, education that is, in some sense, is on on the wane. It's, it's going out of. It's going extinct. <laughs> uh, and I'm trying to revive it. But it, but what really is necessary, and I, I say this to everyone, is you, anyone who st starts. Re says, as you, I think you said yourself. <clears throat> reading is fine. I'm self-taught when it comes to Heidegger. I had no. I did not attend any lecture course on Heidegger before I started my PhD on him. But the, the basics were there. And it, it's what will be important going forward is to get it across how important it is, for example, to write and to write a, an extended piece. Uh, dialoguing is important, but dialoguing can go to you know, can go into the many directions. So to sit down and to be, to write something that has five or 10,000 words, 20, 30, 40 pages, and at the same time, then to get commentary, also very critical commentary, uh, almost destructive commentary is uh, harsh, you know, harsh, but honest. Uh, so helpful. It's only helpful when it's, when it's sincere and not just uh, attempts at, character destruction as sometimes happens at conferences as you may know so but but that, that's that's really crucial going forward that this um is taken up by by those who are outside the institutions and want to engage with philosophy or poetry or so in a in a sincere manner is i encourage everyone to start uh, writing and to be um, yeah well to be careful with the language and also to be open to uh, commentary, not feedback. I refuse to say feedback. I have to stop myself all the time. I have to say it. But to, to receive 
comments, commentary means to think with, that also will be critical. And because that's how you learn. You don't learn if everyone just agrees with you and it just collapses into some sort of really uh, meaningless, uh, meaningless agreement on everything. That, that can't be the way I think. No, I agree. That's the tragedy of like the changes that are happening in the institution. Cause I spent about a decade and you learn from six weeks of constant feedback from someone that's been at the top of a field for 20 or 30 or more years, 40, even 50 years. Some of these emeritus are like, Oh yeah, I started yeah. when I was 22 and you're like, you're almost 80. You know, so you get these these people and what they say is it's it is vetted. That's like in the, in the, the best possible sense. These people are going to conferences, adapting, going back, adapting. Yeah. And because all the people get to dedicate all their time yeah. to a, an expertise, they can get very, very good at it. It's it's really just the the lack of the human spirit, the lack of caring about students, the lack of you know, thing of vacation of just the human soul or what whatnot. There's just all the bureaucracy and the amount of waste that happens it's, in these other, but but you're right, like there's like almost this forging of the samurai sword. And I wrote more and read more in like two and a half years than I could have in like a decade of like meeting with people like Daniel or you or or just in the 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 fun loose wilderness of the internet where I get to pick and choose what I do. I don't write every day and I don't read 20 papers in two weeks and stuff like, but I have, so I can totally appreciate if I wanted to say something new about someone like Heidegger, I can't just go like, well, I'm special. I've read two books. I need to have, you know, developed in such a way to, to be able to do that, especially consistently. And I, I, Again, I don't know you that well, but I've sat in on a couple of your lectures and I'm just, it's just awesome when you, someone will say something and then you'll have like just a natural response and it's so much richer than if I signed up for like an online philosophy course on some, you know, uh, yeah, there's just such a contrast. I very much appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Is it, which one, you were in the Plato uh, Republic or the, the cave myth yeah the cave myth yeah exactly and i think also in which one that was it yes yeah, so I, I you always do things on the weekends and my weekends are just very busy so i unfortunately um <laughs> i did daniel's nishitani course but even that That's, i thought so that I, I knew yeah exactly so that was as a self-study yeah because i thought i'd be able to take it and then like again my schedule just didn't line up and so I, but I watched everything and I read along and I see Daniel. I think I saw Daniel every week that it happened and Thomas <laughs> as well. So, um, very good. Yeah. yeah so the, 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 um, but this is, it's a, and, and the question will be how, I mean, obviously look, this it's, it's, it is, there is a, I think you said wilderness is a good word, perhaps it is still a uh, wild, but as it, over, I mean, this is, and it's also very young, you know. So there's, there's no rushing into it, and and it it, it does it does happen with, not with everyone, but with some who start um, who do start uh, to you know writing, and even extended pieces. Uh, you look at Daniel, is uh, an example. He hasn't got a doctorate, and not an MA as far as I know, but studies Japanese studies in Vienna and is can teach his own courses. And he came up through the through, through well through the guild. He he signed up to the first course a couple of years ago on leisure, <laughs> incidentally. Um, this was in early this is in March 2020. And he came to every single one of them and in 2021 or so. I think I said to him, why don't you try and teach something on Japanese philosophy? Let's see what happens. And that's the Nishitani course that John Rebeki is also very uh, supportive of. Yeah, he went to and, one. Yeah, yeah. So did Guy, I think, in that original one. 
Yeah, and but for example, you look at—I mean, I can't really speak for John, but the, I can. I can. So I can't speak for Jordan Peterson either. But well, Peterson has left his academic position, and his is different, he, though. He was kind of—they were happy to see him go. He's a controversial fellow. <laughs> well, I mean, he may be controversial, but you know, what's wrong with being controversial? Uh, no, the, no. I mean, in some sense, that is philosophy, right? Like, if you're not controversial, are you even doing philosophy? Um, yeah, and, and he's not a philosopher, right? He's a psychiatrist and a cognitive scientist and reads Jung and Nietzsche, perhaps. But I think one of the reasons why he left <laughs> is to leave because of uh, insane levels of bureaucracy and uh, requirements that have nothing to do with forming and educating young minds, but with uh, something else. And... Um, but I think also when you look at Raveki, and I know John well, uh, I think what I can say, because that's in the public, I, that's at least how I perceive it. So this is, I'm not speaking, this is not anything he said to me, but this is how I see it. Why does he upload the meaning crisis to YouTube? This 50 something uh, lecture series, which will, I think will, which will be published as a book uh, at some point. As far, that's, what he mentioned when he was in London earlier this year. Yeah, so, yeah, they're done, and then like the final process is done. Yeah. So with so that came out of so why is that on YouTube? Why didn't he just teach it at the University of Toronto? I think I said I think uh, <clears throat> it's because who would you know who would allow that? Maybe he's done parts of it, but to to teach so to teach in a way that for, so. Um, I have a few editions from Heidegger here, and uh, many of them are lecture courses. So he was given he was given a title, for example, "Fundamental Concepts of Metaphysics." Right? He takes that title, and he talks about world, loneliness, and boredom. That's I mean, they're not really fundamental concepts of metaphysics. So you can see, but he was, there was so much freedom still back then, and he simply could, was able to develop his philosophy further of mood and attunement and being in the world. And, and there was almost no oversight. Uh, today, what you're, the way in which you're supposed to teach is with, is with PowerPoint presentations, every year the same course, uh, and it, it's all extremely structured. You did, no one really writes their own lecture courses anymore. Well, that's right. When, when I was a student, graduate student, um, they flat didn't want new courses to be added. I said, oh, there's this need and we could do this and you could contribute. And they go, no, we don't do new things here. And, and I, the phrase diploma mill is really like a great way to describe the system. They're just trying to fill 400 person halls and just print diplomas and mass um, and, and the creativity is, is completely stifled. It's really, yeah. and then the publishing system also, sti it punishes people that wanna take big risks. So if you never get you know 100 people to take big risks, you don't get a big new idea until they're at the top of their career or a fluke, right? Like, so these big ideas like John or Jordan Peterson, they can actually live in the digital ecology and do what, what John just loves to teach. And he yeah. said about his series and about especially the podcast that it's it's to be like adult education, to be like a continuing so that that human beings that desire more than just a job and a family can grow intellectually. <laughs> um, and to to love to teach means to be to be willing to learn. Uh, and to right john's a learner the virtue of learning is something that i think attracted me to john and we've talked many times about just i mean like what is the mind right like that's the cool thing that that groups of people can come together and wonder about and cognitive science can take steps and philosophy can take steps and that's fun for some set, subset of people to experience right it's like oh i didn't know the mind could do that or i I love the way you said that about the mind and uh... yeah and but also think about this it's it's not just that you're no longer really so let's say there's an interest in stoicism let's have a course on stoicism no that's impossible blah 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 
it's much because that would also just be a grouping together of already known uh, uh, here's a bit of Marco Aurelius, here's a bit of Cicero, here's a bit of Seneca, etc. 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 There's there's the, the courses that, for example, Heidegger wrote or that Hegel wrote, they are they would be completely impossible. Just something where someone just Heidegger's introduction to metaphysics is an interpretation of Sophocles Antigone. It's easier to do that at a community college because there might be less oversight than at a top, top program. Because yeah, but the, you see the, the oversight but, of the top programs. Uh, that, that, yeah, but that's weird. That's very, that's very strange. No, Why it's tragic. No it's really sad that like college yeah. was a place for aspiration to continue. And uh, now it's become a place to like, waste four more years of your young adult life and then go get a job for for like sweeps of people even thomas like thomas thomas loves philosophy and he now like doesn't want to participate in the university of like as a philosopher right like that's there's something wrong <laughs> when a system that houses philosophers pushes away people eager to do philosophy and luckily, there's a net of you to grab some of these poor lost souls or some of these young souls is better than lost souls and then show them philosophy again, like rekindle their their early passion and give them a new place to flourish. Yeah. And it, for me, that I, I have my thoughts why some of these things are happening that you can say they're structural and uh, but there i think there's there are also elements that <clears throat> to a certain degree really need to get rid of the thinking being um and and make sure that you know these what, what was so completely commonplace in in europe uh, is it, crowded out the process which they you know technocrats have a good sense of humor they they met in Bologna which is the birthplace of the Universita of the first university of the world uh, in the late 90s to homogenize the European university system that's something no one ever talks about and it meant that universities were turned into high schools where you don't study for the sake of studying and you've got you know you used to have for example in Germany you used to have two years of not being graded you just studied you just read a bit of Kant and you read a bit of Plato all the foundational texts when we stay with philosophy now they get credit points I mean that's an interesting word <laughs> they get credit points you know uh, which reminds me always of Dia's Dia's X that computer game where there's no but the money's called just credit, which is very honest. You know, it's just credit points that you have. Yeah. So you get credit points at university, um, and you get credit and you get credit points, and they're just hunting for credit points. The students now they they want it to be schooled, so they want to be told uh, what to do and what to think, and how to uh, get the mark and then get out again. Well, that's what the multiple choice test is, right? There's no creativity when only one answer is right and three are yeah. wrong. And it's just your, they teach to the test. And uh, like you said, was... it becomes this like carrot and stick game. And that's what I liked about economics other than, because I've studied psychology and I've studied a lot of different things. And economics is old enough to have a history and you can go, no, mercantilism, that was huge. And then we moved beyond it. And then there was, Marxism and then there was this and it's you can actually see a growth whereas psychology psychology just kind of pops up replaces religion and then uh, yeah. it's at the table as this weird like, oh I'm, I'm a psychologist and people like you can persuade them by just saying oh there was a study and they're like oh let's do that then it's like <laughs> the baby at the table this is the youngest I mean it does great things I love psychology but it's like it has too much credit <laughs> Well, the, the belief in, in, in science, yeah, that's uh, another topic. It's a, it's a strange, it's 
so yeah it's quasi religious but at the same time to, uh, nothing is binding any of the results of any of the disciplines together anymore and there are profound reasons for this one of them is the this is going a bit far off now but one of them is to do with the collapse of metaphysics there's I mean, you know, look, uh, just a second. Heidegger gave an inaugural, inaugural lecture uh, at the University of Freiburg in the late 20s. And I hope I can find it now. And he said, I mean, you have to have the guts to do that, you know. To stand up there and say this is not a university <laughs> not Fre not specifically freiburg but um so uh, this is going to be very bumpy and wooden because this is coming from the chairman so the areas of the sciences are far uh, apart from each other the ways in which they are treated and the ways in which they treat of their objects is profoundly or fundamentally diff different and distinct. And then he says, die zerfallene Vielfältigkeit. So there's a collapsed multiplicity mm -hmm. of disciplines, a collapse. Right, John collapsed says that too, like synoptic integration is like trying to remedy that or bridge these uh, siloed entities that all have too much self uh, opinion that they see the truth, yet aren't yeah. integrated in a way that is useful. So the, these disciplines are only held together by the technical organization, or we would say maybe the technological organization, bureaucratic, etc., of universities and faculties. However, um, what a university is, is no longer even asked. And that would be the fundamental question. I think it's not the right approach to just find one way of bringing everything back together, because that's just another technical attempt. The more profound attempt is to say, what is it is at all going on such that this weird um, explosion in terms of knowledge, etc., is at all possible or is occurring, while at the same time leading to no real sense. Uh, so uh, that perhaps is the more painful road. And it and once, if if that is the case, then the university is indeed spent, because it it you know it's going to reinvent itself and it's going to be, it's going to come back with full force and go, probably there will be big universities that have online presences and get people signing up online from anywhere in the world and they just turn out degrees. Um, you know, uh, the, the big names are already doing this uh, in, in the UK and probably I would guess also in the US. So they, they can have not 10,000 or 20,000 students, they can have 500,000 students every year. And as yeah, an intern, yeah. right? Because it doesn't matter where they are. And there's no have, human contact and there's no care about the student and there's well, no vision. No, and, and, but, uh, and, 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 every, so, and then everything needs to be always the same course because that that's how you can so it, it's all going to be just mere repetition forever for, that's right for that's kind of the industrial model right that beat europe when america <laughs> kind of beat europe in the industrial model it <laughs> became this mass production and now we're just mass producing our adults souls or something like that um no i think yeah. you're because because i mean I, I don't know if you've ever heard of the five foot shelf it's this like 1910s idea from this american and he tried to put a, a well-balanced array of science, economics, religion onto like a selection that could fit on five feet of bookshelf. And they're just really yeah. like a lot of, of Greek, a lot of like Adam Smith is in there and Marx and just all of like these great thinkers and kind of like great pieces among them. And you can kind of educate yourself and just dive in and like you said, like write essays or take notes or reflect. <laughs> But now it's it's a uh, okay. Do I have an A? Am I taking my maximal number of classes? Am I maximizing my time? And you're not yeah. in like the scholastic 
to use your language mode yeah, and of, the, you know yeah and in the end result of this the logical consequence is won't come that far because it will collapse before them but the oh, it's, yeah, it's not sustainable it's tragic the logical the logical consequence of this would be to, to not, not to have real students but to have digital copies of them you know uh, who who can much more efficiently uh, hoop through these uh, jump through these loops? Do you see what I'm trying to say? Uh, like if of, Amazon of, could make customers to buy Amazon products, it would just do that. That's ex that's that, that's <laughs> the end game. That's exactly what Amazon really really needs and wants. It's so sad. Yeah, it's such. It's a, it's yeah. it's one Amazon warehouse buying from the other Amazon warehouse. Right. Where is Jacques uh, Cousteau? Where is the dreamer and the that's why I love poetry because it's like, where are the explorers? Where are the the Gene Roddenberries that want to go to a new place? And because it's it's human, not because of the efficiency and the oil. Like, let's get on an asteroid and extract all the precious metals. It's like, let's just get on an asteroid and, and paint a painting from there or something. That'd be way cooler than than all this awesome stuff. <laughs> yeah, it, it's. It's it is a weird time, but it has to do. It comes back to how we think. For sure, and you if know. we think of ourselves as so, it's a form of alienation, and alienation only occurs through thinking. We're back with the question: What is idealism? If we just think that we can, well, we're just machines. We're just a lump of DNA. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. We're, what an image of a self. Yeah, I mean, sorry, you know, I mean, you can think you, 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 you someone reached out, I forgot his name, doesn't matter. He said, uh, human beings are hack, hackable animals. I mean, speak for yourself. I mean, if you, if you want to think of yourself like that, he's quite influential. I'm not going to say his name, it doesn't matter. He, you, you say this, but as I, always, I keep it with Kant. Kant says in his essay on the Enlightenment, he says, we live in an age of enlightenment. I'm not sure we live in, an, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not sure we live in an enlightened age. And he says at the very beginning, what is enlightenment? When the human being is, finds himself in selbstverschuldete Unmündigkeit. So self-inflicted irresponsibility, self-inflicted immaturity. Uh, and it's, I hold to that, it's, it's self-inflicted. If you want to believe that you are just a, a lump of DNA and uh, completely controllable and hackable, then off you go. You've given. You've you know. You've you've given up your freedom, um, and however, the it that's a a free act, free decision to make, and at the same time, those who wouldn't follow that path, if that even is a path, they can find. Still, this is why you know we need to leave the institutions because it's no longer taught the meaning of life if you like the 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 free um the how to because freedom is not uh, given it, you need to uh raise to the level of of free rationality yeah and henry henry corban says you have to prepare yourself to be ready for god right it's not just you don't just get to have god you have to put in the effort to be ready for beauty or goodness or newness or you don't yeah, yeah. you don't get to have, you don't you don't get to have anything right nothing nothing's given your body isn't given you, you walking isn't given you don't mm -hmm. just you don't just fall into the world and oh i'm walking no it you have to stand up fall down and make yourself and once you've learned how to stand up straight it it, does, it doesn't just stay this way you have to learn this is coming back to peterson he's not wrong you know no, he's great. I loved him <laughs> for multiple tells, years. And he says, yeah. "Stand up tall with your shoulders back." Uh, is 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 a continuous effort, and that, by the way, is very much the idealism of Hegel: is to not only not simply negate nature, but to negate it and negate it again, to come back to it, to realize that we can't um, get rid of our nature, but we have to not embody it but n spirit it to spiritualize our nature uh then we're free and not just uh, lumps of we can't be we can't be just reductively lumps of dna or whatever but i know uh, you have to go also, i and so yeah. i don't want to hold you but uh oh, yeah, go ahead finish your plan yeah. go ahead no so 
it's it's a spiritualizing of nature and that leads to a full embodiment i would say and the yeah well i i think that perhaps in closing <laughs> that's the, a beautiful place the, to rest the, right yeah in 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 closing it's it's a it's a it is a wild time and it's at at the same time it's when i think now is where the seeds are being sown for the next uh, uh decades or this century one of the things that i find very weird about our, our generation i'm 37 now and the younger ones is that they don't really see this century as theirs Oh, it's so uh, sad. Uh, yeah, I have a poem I wanted to read, but we'll just I'll, I'll share it later or something. But yeah, the the like Emerson talks about like he says a thought. So uh, I'll just read the, the quote. Um, Emerson also states that good poetry is not solely a matter of technical prowess, right? This tech name that, that we're kind of alluding to for it yeah. is not meters, but a meter making argument that makes a poem a thought so passionate and alive that like it's the spirit of a plant or an animal. It has an architecture of its own. That's what you were just talking about. And adorns nature with a new thing, right? Like there's the newness is right. We're yeah. just like an inch from it, but you have to make that inch. You have to step across that line. And we're, we've like become these cowards, these like introverted kind of consumers, uh, self-police too. It's like, I live in this, this country where you can literally do anything. We unfortunately have a super high cost of living so you almost have to like become a slave to some job. But if you can avoid that trap, you could do whatever you want. You could start Academy online and find, you know, people like Daniel and nurture their human soul with your wisdom and with, with, with what's already inside of them. Uh, so I was a little passionate at the end, but go ahead and please have the last word. <laughs> That's and, fine. Okay. It has to be, it has to be pulled out, you know, but it also has to find its own form at once so it's building formation forming but also education at once getting something pulled out and yeah thank you very much Robert yeah I'd love to do this again sometime I know you're super busy and one day I will take a class with you that's not it's such a conflict but yeah thank you so much and you write beautiful translations and you inspire my friends and you have lovely hair I could say that with confidence and yeah I, I just I love your talks with John as well and so much of what you're doing so thank you very much robert thank you all right thank all you right. very much for talking to me thank you so much have a great afternoon or evening I guess. send me when it's send me a link when it's out please yeah i'll definitely reach out before i post it and get all like information you want to put in the footnotes and everything excellent thank you awesome thank you see you soon bye bye Eric.